Well, howdy, everyone. Welcome back to the Spooky Soup Podcast. I'm Jesse. And I'm Tessa. I'm still, like, mentally trying to get over your story from last week. Ah, I'm sorry. It's so dark. (laughs) It is very dark. But that's the point of this podcast is we share the dark. The heavy. The unfortunate. Exactly. With a little sprinkle of humor here and there. Yeah. Well, today um, I have the historical story. And it's not as, uh, it's definitely wild. Um, it's going to blow your mind hole, <laughs> but it's not as, I don't know. It's still dark, but hopefully it won't be as like draining as that one was, you know? I just want to apologize to anyone who was affected by that. I would say don't even apologize. Okay. It's the truth. Okay. People got to know is, the truth. It is the truth. So... Yeah, just know, uh, if you haven't listened to it, just tread carefully. It's a pretty heavy topic, so. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about the part two of Tessa's Jones, uh, Jim Jones, Jonestown story. It's wild. Check it out. If you didn't hear it, part one is, you know, I called it White Nights in Cyanide. Um, It's intense. It's not as bad, but part two is definitely where it gets pretty crazy. So just tread carefully. Yep. Okay, so you have the Reddit stories for us today? I sure do. Awesome, awesome. Um, Before we get to your stories, just want to let everyone know that you can, uh, if we have any pictures that are associated with our stories today, we will post those on our Instagram um, and our TikTok as well. You can check those out there. And then if you are a listener who would like to hear uh, one of your own stories read on the podcast, you can Email those to us at SpookySoupPodcast801 at gmail.com or DM those to us on our Instagram. And you guys, please send us your stories. Last week, we had an amazing story from a listener. Go give it a listen. It's about a cryptoid I've never heard of before, and it was so cool. (laughs) Yep, Creechlings. Creechlings, baby. check it out. Cryptoid? Cryptid? Something. We're all cryptids around here. It's okay. (laughs) Okay, um, if you're ready, go ahead. Oh, I'm ready. All right, everyone. This first one comes to you from r slash Backwoods Creepy, posted by Cinnamon Super. It's called Rural Oklahoma Stories. When I was growing up, we lived near a town called Welty in Oklahoma. It's really not much of a town, just a tiny store, some churches, and a lot of farms. We lived off the main road close to an area called Macabre which is also nothing but farms and a cemetery and not even considered a town. Very middle of nowhere. And side note, if I'm being honest here, those are the best cemeteries to go visit, like on road trips. It's just like middle of nowhere cemeteries. Mm-hmm. They I just kind of pop out and you're like, whoa, what the heck? Yeah, I'm like, who's this fella who died in 1819? <laughs> Plenty of them in Utah, but they're more like in the middle of a desert. Which makes for a really cool photo shoot, just yeah. saying. My family told a lot of creepy stories about this place, especially having to do with orbs and weird deer, strange enough. I do have memories of seeing orbs floating over the trees and have no idea what those were, but I never personally saw anything else. My dad has always been a skeptic and never chimed in on these stories. He's got Alzheimer's and has a great memory of the past, but horrible short term. The other day, he was telling me how much he loved living out there and wished he could still live there, and I brought up the orbs and the creepy stories my family always shared. He agreed that they were always creeped out out there, but then he told me he actually saw something really odd once. He told me one night he was sitting on the porch by himself, and a man ran through our yard wearing what looked like a deer head. Not just the antlers, but like the actual deer's head. He just ran through and continued on down the road into the pitch black. My dad didn't know what to think of it. He just told me he thought people out there had too much time on their hands. My mom and brother also saw what they said was a deer walking upright all the way down the road. I know deer do this, but they said it just kept walking like that in the middle of our road. My aunt also said they passed a man who was wearing a deer's head on the road one night. There aren't streetlights in this area, so he was just out there alone in the dark, just standing there. Now, I've heard this could be a Wendigo. 
I think it's some tweakers in the backwoods yeah. with a deer on their head. Uh, yeah, I'm guessing it's uh, <laughs> some guy got drunk. He noticed the deer head on the wall, <laughs> and, and he threw it on himself and went out for a fun little spook. <laughs> I could see that. <laughs> You know, just trying to scare people. Yeah. Sure. Haven't we all done something like that as teenagers? Definitely. All right, everyone. Story number two comes from r slash scary stories posted by 10 Minute Horror. It's called, in the 90s, I picked up a hitchhiker who won't leave me alone. I was traveling through Eastern Europe at the time and heard about a curse involving a hitchhiker on an abandoned road. I was the kind of person who ran towards stuff like that. I wish I hadn't though. This road was on the outskirts of a town and the locals gave me a good warning about it. The warning was simple. Once the sun drops, don't drive down Savaska Road. I asked if that was because the looters or gangs or punk kids in the area, but the locals said no. It was because of the curse of Abtostopik, which is Ukrainian for the hitcher. They just warned me not to think about myself, but also my friends and my family. I was curious, but lied and said I'd take their warnings. That night, I went on a drive for Sevoska Road. On the map, it showed the road started and finished with dead ends that had offshoots left and right. Sevoska was six kilometers long, but a straight line distance between its beginning and end was only one kilometer. The road curved and swirled so much it made the length of the trip six times longer. I arrived at the offshoot that led onto Savotska. The entrance looked like every other quiet country road I'd passed to get here. But this road was separating two sets of forest which grew thicker and canopied overhead the further you went in. I turned onto Savotska and drove 30 feet before the road curved off to the right. It turned sharply right again, left again, and before I knew it, I lost all sense of direction. I drove slow, taking my time, as I followed the winding road through the thickening woods. After five minutes, I came out of the other side, and Savoska ended. Either I could go left or right, but Savoska Road was gone. The locals said that driving down the road was like playing Russian roulette. People mostly got lucky, and the curse wouldn't materialize. But sometimes, if you turned your headlights off for a minute while driving, then turned them back on, it would cause the curse to manifest. I flicked off my headlights and slowly re-entered Savoska. Without my lights, I was just barely able to see five feet ahead. A minute passed, then two. I turned my lights back on and immediately saw something ahead. A figure was standing to the right of the road. Its arm was out, thumb was up in a hitchhiking position. I drove closer and made out the details of the figure. It was a man, a homeless vagrant wearing a priest outfit with a dirty collar. His hair was dark and wild, and his eyes were demented. His face was covered in bloody wrinkles. I couldn't tell if he was smiling or screaming. Within seconds of seeing him, I'd sweat through all my clothes. I pushed the gas down to speed by him, but it had the opposite effect. The car slowed. I slammed the gas pedal, stomped it, kicked it, but the car crept along, idling up next to the hitcher. The hitcher came right up to the window, pressing his bloody, wrinkled face against it. His smile pushed through the glass without breaking it, and I felt his cold breath on my face. His eyes shimmered like a cat's with the orange glow. At this point, I'd realized, somehow, I'd confused the gas pedal with the brakes and switched my feet. I hit the actual gas and peeled away, leaving a bloody wrinkle smear across the passenger side window. I whipped around the next corner, and the hitcher disappeared from my rear view. But he reappeared three more times along the side of the road as I tried to get off Savolska. Finally, I reached the entrance and got onto the next road, and the next, and before I knew it, I was back in the village. I went to my hotel, got my things, and cut my vacation short. The next day, I was on a flight back home, but I kept seeing him. It wasn't often, but sometimes when I'd drive at night, I'd see the hitcher on the side of the road. He started off with just a smile and a wave, then he started running out into the street to get in front of my car. Then he started trying to jump on my car. I was always alone, so I could never ask anyone if they saw him. I couldn't tell if it was all in my head or if it was real. I never saw him when I was walking, so the small amount of time I actually spent in a car went to nearly zero. 
I rarely traveled in cars or buses or any forms of road transit. I basically walked everywhere. But I stopped driving or riding the transit altogether two years after I drove down Zavoska. I was DDing my friend Jamie home from, din from a dinner party when I saw the hitcher in the middle of the road. I swerved to avoid him and figured Jamie thought I was crazy. But Jamie saw the hitcher too. He described the hitcher's priest-like outfit and wondered why he was in the middle of the road raging at me. I wasn't sure if it felt better knowing someone else could see the hitcher, or worse, knowing that the hitcher had followed me home from Zavoska and was in fact real. A week later, Jamie called me and told me he'd seen the hitcher again when he was out for a drive with his wife. She saw him too. A few days later, they both died in a car accident. I haven't stepped in a car again since. The last week, I rode the city bus for the first time in years, and the second stop after I got on, I saw him, the hitcher. He was on the side of the road, and he had my friend Jamie with him and Jamie's wife, who were both badly decomposed, but not dead. I could see them weakly struggling, but they were being held up by the back of their necks by the hitcher, who was in complete control. The hitcher made two bodies move around like grotesque ventriloquist dummies as he himself laughed and danced. We drove past the spectacle and I realized everyone on the bus was staring at the hitcher too. Oh. That was a good one. It's just the curse that keeps on cursing. So now everyone on the bus is cursed. Everyone. Damn, good story. It's like a Samara from The Ring. You know, mm -hmm. you see the videotape, pass it on, you see the hitcher, drive with someone else. They see the hitcher and they die. So there you go. <laughs> oh, and that part about him holding them up. Yeah. For some reason I saw like in my mind, I was picturing him like holding them up by, by their spine because they're like decomposing, you know? <laughs> Have you seen Dead Silence? I've not. Okay. I won't ruin it for you, but it's a movie about this old lady who had a ventriloquist collection and when she died, she had them all buried with her. Well, turns out that the locals are going to that place where she died and all the dolls were dug up from the ground. And so they call in this dude to solve this mystery. Anyways, there's a scene with the spine and the ventriloquism and stuff like that. So I actually have seen a clip now that you say that. I think you were watching it once and I saw like a second of it or something. But yeah creepy very creepy all right those are my stories for today what okay. do you got okay thank you for those two stories um i'm spooked and i'm ready to go are you ready for my story i'm so ready for this okay well this is one of those stories that has never sat right with me and i don't think it ever will today's story is about hisashi uchi the man who was exposed to so much radi radiation that his skin melted off. Ugh. Hisashi Uchi was a husband and father of one son. Uchi was a Japanese technician who was involved in a catastrophic radiation accident that occurred on September 30th, 1999 at the JCO nuclear fuel processing plant in Tokaimura, Japan. I apologize for those for mispronouncing those names. <laughs> the accident resulted in the worst nuclear accident in Japan's history, surpassing the severity of the 1957 Windscale Fire in the United Kingdom. At the time of the accident, Uchi was working with two other technicians, Masato Shinohara and Yutaka Yokokawa in the preparation of an unlicensed batch of fuel for experimental purposes, purposes. Keep in mind that all three of these technicians did not have the proper experience. One of the two other technicians was standing at the top of a steel tank and used a bucket to pour a solution into the tank. Uchi leaned over that same tank with a funnel to catch the contents from the bucket to help manually mix a solution of enriched uranium. This was obviously violating safety protocols and it caused a chain reaction that led to a nuclear accident. One of the, one of the technicians who sat behind a wall of glass 
recalls an extremely loud bang sound and a quick flash of light lighting up the whole room. The accident caused an intense burst of radiation which affected the three technicians. Uchi was the most severely affected you know, because he was leaning over the tank as he received an estimated dose of 17 sieverts of radiation, which is more than eight times the lethal dose. Ooh. The dose caused his body to experience severe radiation sickness, which resulted in damage to his DNA, blood cells, and other organs. It was so bad that the doctors found that he had almost zero white blood cells left and thus no immune system. Ooh, that's no good. Following the accident, Uchi was immediately taken to the University of Tokyo Hospital, where he received emergency treatment. He was kept alive through the use of blood transfusions and intravenous fluids and drugs that helped to stimulate his bone marrow, which had been severely damaged by the radiation. Uchi didn't realize how bad it initially was because he felt great. He even told doctors that he felt fine, and just by looking at him, you would probably agree, but he so desperately wanted to go home and see his family. As you could probably tell, that didn't last very long and the doctors did not give him a choice. He had to stay so they could examine him and see what was going to happen next. In reality, as soon as the explosion happened, Uchi was already dead. He just didn't know it yet. Ugh, this reminds me of the uranium girls that you were talking about. Mm-hmm. Ugh. Yep. I didn't realize. I guess I'm on like a radium kick. Not uranium. Radium. Radium. Sorry. <laughs> Close. Still. Both still, horrible. <laughs> still deadly. He then began to experience severe headaches and body aches, but despite the efforts of the medical team, his condition continued to deteriorate rapidly, and he suffered from a range of severe symptoms, including severe skin damage, internal bleeding, and a high fever. Over the course of the next several months, Uchi was treated with a range of experimental treatments and procedures, including skin grafts, stem cell transplants, and other forms of supportive care. You have to understand the horrible things that were happening to him. His organs were failing, his skin was melting off, and he was alive and awake for all of it. Oh my gosh. Whether he felt it or not, he was watching his body literally fall off of him. It's off like, of itself. It's like being skinned alive. Yeah. Uh, there's an image of him post skin falling off, and I have to say it is nightmare fuel. Are you ready to see this picture? Yeah. Surprisingly, I'm like super ready for this. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You were not kidding. Wait, is his leg gone? No, it's like just... Like on the one side, it looks like just a stump. It does, but I think they're both being held up. And they're just... Um, oh, the yeah, yeah, I the, see. At the angle of the image, they're both like just right lined next to each other. So it's hard to see it. Oh my gosh. I bet he was in so much pain. Yeah, that's uh, pretty much from that image. There's no skin left. It's all of his muscles exposed of whatever just muscles flesh. are left. Yep. So you can see that, once again, pretty much all that's left is muscle that's just barely hanging on. This is a side note that I thought about, but like going to the bathroom for him was, I'm going to guess, impossible. So I'm guessing that he was also covered in his excre excrement. Yeah, I don't imagine and, he'd be able to. And probably uncontrollable too at that point. Yeah. I don't think he'd even be able to digest considering his organs are failing. Mm -hmm. Um. At one point, his tears be were just straight up blood. And so oh. anytime he cried, he would just see red. Why wouldn't they just put him out of his misery? Because they wanted to see what would happen. That is the point of the story. Oh my gosh. That's evil. It's very evil. He was begging for them to end his life for days. But the doctors were so intrigued with how his body was dealing with the radiation, so they kept him alive as long as they could. His condition, his condition continued to deteriorate, and he eventually fell into a coma. 
Despite the best efforts of the medical team, Uchi's condition continued to get worse, and he eventually died on December 21st, 1999, 83 days after the accident. What? They kept him alive for that long? 83 days. They knew what they were doing. 100%. What is wrong with them? Yep. I don't care if it's for science. You don't do that. Inhumane. Totally. The tragedy of Hisashi Uchi's story is not only the severity of his injuries, but also the controversy surrounding his treatment. His family alleged that the medical team had kept him alive for far, for far too long and had not taken into account his wishes to die. They also claimed that the experimental treatments that were used on him had caused him to suffer unnecessary pain and had not been adequately tested before being used on him. The Japanese government launched an investigation into the accident and the medical treatment of the victims. The investigation con concluded that the accident was caused by a combination of human error, inadequate safety protocols, and poor management practices at the GCO plant. The investigation also found that the medical treatment of the victims had been inadequate and had not taken into account their wishes or their quality of life. I mean, did they really need an investigation to conclude that? Didn't they just see that picture and think, oh yeah, this was bad? Yeah, no. I mean, I'm going to guess the doctors knew very early on that there was no way he was going to make it. So they just wanted to play and see what would happen. I would love to do the same to those doctors, right? see how they like it. The story of Hisashi Uchi is a tragic reminder of the dangers of working with nuclear materials and the importance of prior prioritizing safety in the nuclear industry. It is also a reminder of the importance of ethical considerations in medical treatment and the need to ensure that patients wishes and quality of life are taken into account when making decisions about their care. Once again, I cannot imagine the pain he went through, but may he rest in peace. And I hope that he somehow will be able to get justice. Yeah, I hope so too. Karma, baby. So there you have it. Yeah. I wonder what happened to those doctors. Where are they now? I'm sure I, I could have looked that up. Didn't really think to do that. No, that's okay. If you guys are interested, just, Google it. Yeah, I just want to know. I want to know if they kept their license, if they are still practicing, or if an angry mob skinned them alive, like I would like to right now. Yeah. Um, I'm guessing because of the radiation that he was not able to see his family and they weren't able to see him. I didn't even think about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So for those 83 days, I'm sure he just wanted just a glimpse of his family, but they probably did not let him it's like ugh, this is horrible it's like a true story of the russian sleep experiment but like not russian japanese japanese so here's a picture of him nice looking guy yeah 35 years old um to the right is a picture of the tank post-explosion oh okay yeah let's see um, there's him. Uh, that was soon after they brought him into the hospital. Um, you can see there that he is, so far, like from what you can tell, he looks healthy. He's in a bag. He's in a bag. Um, that picture is a little hard to see. You can probably get a close up. But from on the left, he looks pretty much like totally fine. To the right, you know, he's lost hair. Looks like his skin is starting to peel. Looks like he aged 50 years. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know how far apart these images are in like in days, but I'm guessing it's not like there. I'm guessing it's soon after. Yeah. So there you have it. That's terrifying. Oh, now I'm sad. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm sad. In and a spooky way. Yeah. Okay. Well, do you uh, have anything else for us today? Everyone go watch the cute puppy video or something because I'm going to need some eye bleach after this. Yeah, that, um, unfortunately, I will not post the picture of him without skin on the Instagram <laughs> post. Sorry, you guys. Social media is just too... Too sensitive, man. Too they sensitive. Keep, they keep taking down my, my content. Um, you don't even post, like, 
the worst stuff. It's true. Yeah, TikTok keeps taking it down. But um, but if you are curious, you can check those images out. Um, the image of him, um, the graphic one, excuse me, you can find it online um, on your own. Um, for when I can post, I will add to Instagram. So, um, okay. Yeah, well, I'm good. Anything else? That's it for me. All right, guys. We'll scare you in the next one. Stay spooky. Bye.